I think we should probably tell everyone, since we've been gone for six weeks, that we've had two failed podcast efforts in the intervening time. It wasn't as though we just stopped working because of COVID-19. We, we tried to keep working. It just didn't work out for us in the way that we'd hoped. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. We tried to make episodes that addressed this crisis head on in some way. We attempted to try to like make our podcast responsive to the gravity of this situation and just kind of hit a, hit a wall in terms of what we were able to achieve. Yeah. It, it doesn't make any sense to try to say anything uh, coherent about COVID-19 right now. It's sort of like, you know, uh, wondering, like wondering what specific mechanical problem went wrong as your plane is crashing. <laughs> like, well, you know, no one does that. That's an insane thing to do. You just yeah. scream and, you know, become very religious. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so instead of doing a, we were going to do a specialty COVID episode and we're not doing that. We're just coming back as though nothing happened because isn't that what we all want? <laughs> we just want to pretend <laughs> nothing ever yeah, happened I mean, you, and that you know what i say back to work <laughs> open all the businesses now have have our aspirations for the show changed in any way in the aftermath of all of this you know like this is supposed to be season two we're supposed to be well on the road to season two at this point <laughs> <laughs> and what's actually happened remember when we came back from from christmas break and we said we're gonna have we're oh, going to have yeah, guests yeah. and we have some big ideas and we're going to make some changes in the show. And there was a, there was a reason for being for this second season. Now it's just another episode in a new reality. Yeah. The world, the world accelerated into the turn and, <laughs> and we're just being like our blood's being pushed to the left side of our body I, from this. I mean, does it force make And like, we're about to pass out. Like nothing makes sense. Um, just holding on for dear life. Does it make sense to, to have seasons anymore. I mean, one of the things about the COVID experience for me is like sort of a, a different relationship with time. Marking time seems to matter less. I do have meetings that I have to arrive to on time, but days and weeks sort of just like slip into one another. And it's difficult to, to like give shape to the passage of time in the same way. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, a lot of people have noted this, like, uh, you know, one of the most commonly described effects of drug use is time dilation, where things seem to go more quickly or more slowly than they normally do. And uh, like what the reason that that happens is because your relationship, your like phenomenological relationship to reality has been altered and you haven't gained enough stability to experience time as a uniform unfolding hmm. of events or moments, right? And so like everything, like, you know, like time, uh, uh, our experience of reality right now is like moments of incredible quiet and boring boredom uh, one moment. And then, oh my God, the the world is on fire and exploding the next moment. It's like, it, it, like everything is just sort of mixed up, right? And, and Well, uh, I've got an idea uh, then. Destabilized. In that spirit, Season two is over. This is <laughs> this is the beginning of season three. <laughs> this is a season infinity symbol. <laughs> there is no before and there is no after. There is only the forever now. Welcome to Zero Sum Empire, the podcast that's taking a critical census of the roughly 620 mostly anonymous American billionaires. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. We got a couple of billionaires today. Um, some of you may have heard of, some of you may not have heard of. If you're a big fan of uh, like New York City gossip magazines like Vanity Fair, then you've probably heard of a number of the people that we're going to talk about. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, especially today, uh, who are people who get talked about in those magazines. Um, 
That's like one of, it's like a weird, it's a, you know, it's not that weird, all right, because New York City is a locus of wealth. Um, and I, I don't, I don't even know really to what extent these things uh, exist anymore. But like in the 80s and 90s, like gossip about ri- rich people uh, was like well, more wide. That was the era that, and- that gave rise to Trump. I mean, that was, that's, it's that true. is the yeah. deep history. That's the prehistory of the current moment. Maybe that's what's interesting about yeah. it. But yeah, it's like that moment, like, uh, you know, I don't know, salacious magazine articles about uh, misdeeds of the rich and powerful. It's so not different right now. You know, it is. I guess they're just different yeah. media. They're, the information is delivered in different media channels because magazines are dead. I guess that's all I'm saying. All right. All right. Let's uh, let's do the news. Billionaires in the news. So. I'm actually sick of talking about Ray Dahlia. Every episode, <laughs> Chad wants to say some shit about Ray Dahlia. I love. And there's him maybe some so new ang- there, there's maybe some new angles, like the LinkedIn things, kind of funny. But I really am tired of it. <laughs> How, however, <laughs> there is a new variation on the Dahlia theme that is probably better than anything that we've talked about so far. That's true. Um, and this video that you have turned me on to is can only be described as next level. It is. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> it's how are we going to run this? So yeah, so what I so uh, basically uh, Ray Dalio posted a YouTube video of um, of Diddy interviewing him. Um, and asking him questions about his book in 2017, he wrote a book and he's trying to like sell himself as this super business guru. And he wrote, uh, his book of principles. It's like a 600 page book of his principles for like being good at business. And, uh, it's also an app. Did you know it's an app, Joe? It's a free app that you can download in case you need, uh, in case you need principles on the go. (laughs) Have you downloaded it? I did. I did download it. I thought I would... (laughs) I thought I would read the <laughs> listeners some principles because, like, it's deep stuff. It's it's very good. Like, you know, I think the the first one that comes up is embrace reality and deal with it. And under that, there's actually a sub principle, uh, and that sub principle is dreams plus reality plus determination equals. What do you want to guess? What it equals? Equals success. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! You did it. Oh you my did God! It. Wow. Um. Yeah. What can I say? I mean, I'm just a natural entrepreneur. You, you, I don't know. Maybe you are a business genius like Ray Dalio. <laughs> oh, yeah. That formula. Yeah, that's yeah. success. <laughs> Maximize your evolution. Own your outcomes. Diagnose problems. Does, Let's just talk about Diddy. I can't deal with this shit. Yeah. Let's it's talk a, about so Diddy. So, you, you know, you know, listeners uh, of the show will know what I'm talking about. Uh, just j- drivel. Uh, just absolute utterly empty drivel uh and it's very funny to listen to uh uh diddy ask ray daly about this so i thought we could play some clips uh because i think it's pretty entertaining so the first clip is really just like giving you a sampling of what this conversation is like and i'm just going to play about a minute here and and i i think that you'll appreciate how is this in the news it's just happening recently well, yeah. Okay. So to be uh, perfectly honest, this actually happened about six months ago, but they just released a second video, uh, uh, I think last month, and I, and I came across it. So it's in the news as far as we're concerned. It's new to us. Yeah. And, and also, we just don't want to talk about coronavirus right now. So Diddy. All right. Let's do it. And, um, and I wanted to um, ask you a couple of questions straight from the things I highlighted in the book. First thing was, so what's your definition of radically open-minded? Um, is to simultaneously have an opinion, like, uh, like, let me give you this, that you think it should go this way. Yes. And then you say to yourself, how do I know I'm right? Maybe that's wrong. Is that as good as I can be? And then the capacity to hear and then challenge. So somebody comes up to you with an idea and says, okay, let's do this. What do you think about that? To harvest the best around you, but sorting it with your own mind. So I say to be open-minded and assertive at the same time. Don't give up your assertiveness, but to be curious, like, am I harvesting the best? 
because the biggest thing that most people have uh, their problem is they get so opinionated that they can't take in. And the worst problem is the worst tragedy of man, kind, almost any individual, is that they're attached to opinions that are wrong and they don't want to have them stress tested. <laughs> okay, okay, so can I say something? Yeah, yeah, you get I mean, it. I'll like, just stop it there. Yeah, you get it. Like, like the more generous part of me wants to imagine that Diddy is somehow punking Dahlia. <laughs> you know, like he looks kind of like a correspondent on The Daily Show doing this interview. Yeah. You know, like it's just really over the top seriousness. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's true. And it's just very difficult to take any of this seriously. I think that Diddy's bullshit all. meter is like is pinging. Like he's he's, you know, yeah, he's got a little <laughs> yeah. bit of skepticism on his face. I mean, how how is Diddy on board? For this video, now, I just don't okay. even understand how yeah. this happened. Well, well, we'll get to that because uh, uh, there's a very weird moment at the end, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to give it away. But uh, hey, let me, okay, I, just, I thought this is a short clip. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, so this is where uh, Diddy asks Ray Dalio how he can be sure that he's hiring the best people. We live in a time where people know how to give really good interviews. So as I've been building, I've been fooled a couple of times. I've written out a very detailed spec sheet. Um, they may say they understand it, but then when, and, and they have given me the appearance that, that, that they um, understand the job and, and they, they do a stellar interview. But then, you know, when we, we're three months into it, into the trenches. Yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, here's the deal. What you do is um, you use the personality profile testing, uh, background checks, and the resume. And I do a thing what, which you call a reverse 360. So to find out uh, not just their resumes, but to find out everybody who knew them in the past. And then you go and do the checking. The reverse 360, a.k.a. invasive surveillance of everyone who's ever known the person. Uh, and, and, you know, like, I don't know if that's so much as a business secret um, as uh, just a, a weird uh, and invasive thing that Ray Dalio does. I thought, you know, I wanted to play this part. This is actually not Dalio, but uh, this is just a, a, a clip of uh, Diddy talking about the levels, um, the levels of excellence that he's reached in his life. I thought it was entertaining i got to a point where I, I was having so much success in so many different areas and so i wasn't paying attention to making sure that the that i was still nurturing the team and then when i had to come back off a tour and i had to get back into business mode you know i realized that you know i had outgrew my team it wasn't like they were bad it's just that they weren't at the level of excellence that I was at. That that <laughs> level of excellence is very, very high for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can relate with that. You know, I've had to leave multiple teams behind. I'm yeah. about to leave this team behind. Chad, I hate to tell you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a really fucking uh, high shit. level of levels excellence. of excellence. And you're just kind of like, you're good. <laughs> you know, you're a good guy. <laughs> um so i'm just gonna play one more i won't belabor this uh i would we'll, we'll put the link in the show description and i, I you know if you want to um I, I watch what i think is a pretty entertaining and funny video uh, uh check it out uh I, this last clip is uh is just like after all this we, we're about 22 minutes into it now and and we're, we're nearing the end of uh video number one and, and diddy wants you to know that this is not an infomercial for ray dalio's book uh, he he wants to be crystal clear that uh, what you are watching is not a commercial. So uh, I thought I, I thought I'd let him make the make the case. I, I want everybody to know how pure this relationship is, and you know this this is um, the 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 only ulterior motive that we have is to empower people through the information of your journey and all the things that you've learned, which we all have to go through as being successful entrepreneurs. So it's official right now. Principles is required reading. If you are becoming an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter if you're eight to 80, you know, it doesn't matter. You could always, it's never too late to start.
and like this is this is why Ray Dalio is my favorite uh, billionaire so far because like every once in a while he'll he'll like write a five thousand word LinkedIn post that says like I went into deep study for eighteen months and I I discovered something that anybody <laughs> could like look up on Wikipedia in five minutes like you know like he'll he'll go into like eighteen months of deep study and emerge with just like the like you know buy low <laughs> sell high or something like, like just like the most obvious stuff and um and you know um and i love him and i hope he comes up more even if you don't like him joe dude i hope he comes up less it's gonna be hard to top this So you're going to talk about Mort Zuckerman today, or no Zuckerberg? No Zuckerman. Or Zuckerberg is uh, Mark. Mark. I wonder if they ever get confused. Zuckerman was the Zuck before the Zuck. <laughs> <laughs> Zuck Prime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Mort Zuckerman is a is a big time real estate guy. He's been in the high profile business world for decades. Had you heard of him before? Now? Yeah, I'd heard his name, but uh, that's that's about as far as it goes. Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't know if I'd heard of him or not, but having researched him, it's one of those moments where I feel like I should have heard of him because uh, you know, on the spectrum of billionaires that we cover on the show, he's way out toward the more public end. He's well he's well known for two things. First and foremost, although he he has done a many, many things over the course of his career. But the two things he's probably most famous for, one, uh, founding Boston Properties, which is a publicly traded real estate trust, a REIT, which Chad, Chad, you've talked about on on the show. Do you feel like you can, for the listeners who are newer to the show, give like a 20 second overview of what a REIT is? I think we've done this before. Uh, REIT is an... We we right. It's an acronym for real estate investment trust, and it's basically just the financialization of real estate. It makes you uh, it, it makes real estate into an investment mm-hmm. vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's so that's, that's good. What it so it, there's a lot of problems with REITs that we've talked about on the show, in, in terms of driving up rents, uh, tax evasive kinds of strategies as well. Absolutely, yeah. But but it, 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 that's sort of getting into the weeds too quickly. Just good to know that that's kind of hovering in the background at a certain level. Boston properties. I don't know, you know how how many skeletons are in their closet, but they are apparently one of the largest property holding companies in the United States, and they've been around since 1970 when Mort Zuckerman founded the company with a couple other guys. So that's the first thing that he's famous for. Where where at? So New New York well, area. Mort right? Zuckerman is a ri- Oh yeah, it's called Boston. <laughs> but he but he lives in New York, right? Like er, Right. Er, so he's originally Canadian, but oh. he became one of the titans of NYC real estate during the 1980s. And Boston Properties is known for having like mega real estate in a in a few key metro centers, including New York and Boston and San Francisco and a couple of other places. But I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm not going to talk a ton about the real estate today, but this is where he's made most of his money. He's also famous, though, for owning the New York Daily News and the U.S. News and World Report. Oh, And he actually served as the editor-in-chief of the U.S. News and World Report for many years. The billionaires that we're talking about today are basically the same exact people. It's really funny. And I know that I we haven't really talked about it yet because we like to keep things a surprise, but I think that you're going to be surprised at how similar uh, the the life stories of these guys are. Well, I look forward to your segment, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, so as I said, Mort Zuckerman is Canadian, but he acquired U.S. citizenship back in 1977. Among other things, he is in the, the skyscraper business. Early in his career, he was a professor at Harvard Business School and also taught at Yale. Mm-hmm. 
Barbara Walters once described Mort Zuckerman as among the best dinner party companions she's ever known. You know who else was popular at dinner parties? Hmm. Very popular at dinner parties? One, um, Mr. Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein was famous for for like having dinner parties and then like and having a bunch of uh, scientists and and saying shit like, "So, what is science?" You know, just like a, a throw out like a really dumb you know, general question. And, uh, <laughs> was and, and was was Epstein sort of like Chauncey Gardner, but also a rapist? <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, that is that's an amazing idea. Like Epstein was just like this idiot uh guy. I mean because like literally he really did fall into Yeah, I mean I kind of know like everything right, that he had, yeah. right? Like uh uh that's yeah, that's a really funny idea. <laughs> uh all right, moving on. What's the first thing that you think of when you hear US News and World Report? College rankings? College rankings. Obviously, we're biased, but I think that if you polled most people... Honestly, I don't know what else they do. I mean, I mean, do they have another function? I mean, obviously, we're not their readership, so their readership might be, think differently. But U.S. News and World Report is very well known for college rankings, and that's the only thing that I really associate with them. So... The magazine implemented this college ranking system in 1983, and Zuckerman acquired the publication in 1984. Thus, the rise of prominence in the U.S. news ranking system really went down under his watch. And I'm going to talk a little hmm, bit okay. about this U.S. news ranking specifically and the, the idea of rankings more generally. If I could, um, if I could guess ahead of time, I'm going to guess that they're super legitimate and very, very worthwhile and uh, are a good way for uh, young people to figure out what college well, that's for to. you to decide, Chad, <laughs> 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 before we get into the specifics of their ranking system. Yeah. Maybe I'll just ask, how big a deal do you think they are? I mean, you're a college professor. I think they I think they are. I think they are a very big deal for people. Uh, who are making decisions about what college to attend, mm -hmm. right? Like that, you know, that it, it's a kind of pedigree, right? Um, very much like a dog show in the sense that like, well, I, I know that it's all nonsense, right? Like that this judge certainly can't make a distinction between whether this German shepherd or this uh, schnauzer is a better dog, right? Like, like they don't, they aren't comparable. They're, ap they're apples and oranges, as they say. Um, uh, nevertheless, I do know that like, uh, people put stock, like people will pretend as if, uh, there is some sort of objective judgment. Well, so yeah, I think you're things. drilling right to the heart of uh, the issue, right, right out the gate here. So, I mean, I would also argue that they are a very big deal. I mean, we both work in higher education. There's the fact that in our world, everybody knows about them and talks about them and sweats them to some degree, no matter where you are on the spectrum. But also, like rather unsurprisingly, studies have shown that lower rankings in U.S. News and World Report result in institutions accepting greater, greater percentages of applicants, fewer accepted students enroll in these institutions, resulting in entering classes that have lower test scores, et cetera. The, the U.S. news ranking system, in other words, is not just a measure. It's a system that actively works to produce and perpetuate certain kinds of outcomes. And, and the right, ranking right. system, as I'm sure you know, uh, and as you were alluding to earlier, is based on, I don't know if we can call them arbitrary inputs, but they're certainly inputs with very specific value systems built into them. And aren't necessarily the same systems that, say, you or I would choose if we were devising our own ranking system. So for those listeners who are maybe less familiar with the system, or maybe it sounds like you don't necessarily know all of the different components of it either, Chad. I've been sort of dialed into this a lot because it's been really relevant to things that have been happening at my college. But I, uh, I have no idea. I have not looked at a 
U.S. News and World Report ranking in a really long time. Well, I won't claim that I knew all of this, but I knew some of it. And and essentially, the the ranking system formula that they use has changed over time and has actually undergone some changes recently, but is broadly based on retention and graduation rates, faculty resources, what they call expert opinions, which is just like experts in the field rating other colleges, but probably also rating their own colleges. So like the idea of there being any sort of objectivity and expert opinion in this world is suspect. Uh, Financial resources, a category they call student excellence, which basically amounts to (laughs) high school grades and test scores. Alumni giving, which is obviously related to financial resources, but it's its own separate category. And uh, recently, they've apparently started factoring in uh, what they call social mobility, which they measure by looking at the number of students who graduate that receive federal Pell Grant money. So uh, that's some sort of metric of people moving up the ladder, perhaps. But so, I mean, having heard that, how do you feel about this model inputs? Is this is this helpful? Uh, is this a, is this a helpful cal- calculation that they're offering the world? No, I don't think so. I mean, like, so something like just take the first one that you said, uh, retention and graduation, right? Like, um, retention means does the student come back the next year, right? Like, do they continue to attend the university? Graduation, of course, means do they fi- do they complete a degree? Those things have much more to do with the financial situation of the student body than they do with the quality of the education. I don't think I've ever met a human being in my life who was like, ah, I quit college because, um, actually, you know, like this is the kind of shit that like Bill Gates, you know, oh, I quit college because I didn't need it or because like the (laughs) education wasn't, wasn't paying off for me. Right. Like people don't do that. People, people quit college because shit happens in their lives or they don't have enough money like, uh, uh, like yeah. that's like, so like where the pool of students, uh, that make up your student body, uh, uh, has much more to do with, uh, whether they, uh, stay in school and graduate right. than like the quality of the education that's right. being delivered. So that's a um, great point. And I'm sure if we spent more time poking holes in the formula, we could come up with myriad examples of how these different factors that they evaluate are missing the point in some fundamental way. Alumni contributions is a really messed up one to me because what that is saying is actually college is not real. What it is, it doesn't, it's not educating you. What it's doing is uh, it's a networking opportunity for you. Right. And so the richer the alumni are, right? The that uh, like that indicates to people that if you graduate from here, you are likely to make. Well, more it's interesting money. though, but that is like and, very transparently what high end MBA programs are all about. You know, I mean, they well, yeah, I mean, they obvi- they yeah. teach you some things and put you through a grinder in certain ways. But what you're really paying the money for, and what you're really hoping to get access for and why you study hard for the GMAT and want those grades is so that you can hang out with princes, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, that's all that it is. There's nothing beyond that. I mean, like Wharton and, uh, and Stern business school, uh, which is named after the billionaire that I'm going to be covering today. Uh, you know, like, uh, that the, the top business schools are, yeah, they're networking opportunities that you buy your way into, right? Like that's, Yeah. yeah. So, so there's all that. The The bigger issue that I wanted to talk about a little bit today that I think is kind of interesting and maybe it's obvious or maybe it's not. You can you can sort of tell me. But I mean, I wanted to just sort of pose the question and wrestle with with the question of where does the impulse to rank come from? And in what way is the idea of ranking and or the, like the history of ranking systems shaped by cultural and economic forces? So, um, like, I'll, I'll just say a couple of quick things. I mean, rank, rankings are actually a very, very well-developed area of scholarly inquiry. I don't know if I would have predicted this or not before researching this today. I mean, everything is sort of a well-developed area of scholarly inquiry at this point. But um, <laughs> one estimate from 2011 
posited that there were over a thousand published papers and books focusing specifically on the theme of university rankings. So it's not as though like people haven't been thinking about this. I just haven't been thinking about this. The founding document of college ranking literature is a short book called Where We Get Our Best Men. That <laughs> was published. Oh, it was published in <laughs> 1900, uh, which basically outlines statistics about like demographics of supposedly successful individuals, but are arguably or apparently the first university ranking system was uh, devised a few years later by a psychologist named James Cattell. Now, C- Cattell studied greatness. I guess in quotes. All right. How how can greatness be made? <laughs> that is a red flag so big that it's covering my entire head, <laughs> yeah. and I can no longer well, listen. To yeah. Anything well, you're, that guy says. you're 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 <laughs> going to be justified brilliantly here in about two point five <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, you know a version of of nature versus nurture research. To what extent are you born great and to what extent can you be made to be great? Um, and as I, I'm, I'm sure you suspected, Chad, the eugenics movement was an important influence on Cattell's thinking. <laughs> especially, wow. So college especially rankings in the beginning. trace their origins back yeah, to so eugenics. Th- yeah. That is zero percent surprising to me. Uh, however, I would probably. But kind of interesting. So ultimately. Yeah. Uh, Cattell would come to believe that nurturing actually contributed more significantly to greatness than he had originally thought. But much of his work <laughs> <laughs> continued to borrow a, a scientific methodology that had been devised by eugenics practitioners. So Cattell's early work focused on the accomplishments of individuals. He's, he published a study called A Statistical Study of Eminent Men in 1903. <laughs> but he would go on to to study universities. It occurred to him at a certain point that universities play pivotal roles in the advancement of science. And once he had this realization, that became a focal point of his research. So one article that I read in preparation for this episode that we can link to in the show notes argues that Cattell's research is the beginning of a, of this process of what we might refer to as like the calculation of institutional eminence or prestige. I, I sent you the article. I'm not sure that you got a chance to look at it and I don't really need, need to go into this. I did not. Setting. I'm sorry. It's okay. But the, the article essentially traces this history beginning with Cattell and, and shows how measuring systems came to describe and define a university's reputation. And it also draws out this connection between eugenics and current notions of of academic rigor and, quote, research quality, like these terms and these ideas that I know that both of us find toxic in certain ways. And and I I think it's an interesting connection to think about. But maybe what's more interesting to think about is how the phenomenon of ranking shapes so much public discourse. It does. It's a way. So what what rankings are, and and everyone knows this, is a way not to a, award or promote uh, individual greatness, uh, to use uh, that guy's mm-hmm. term, uh, but rather to ignore uh, the 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 unfortunate qualities. Uh, of individuals and to funnel them into tracks uh, where they can simply claim their birthright. So we'll take somebody like Jared Kushner as the perfect example. A dumb guy uh, with nothing going for him except being rich. Uh, His father gives, you know, $30 million to Harvard or whatever. And then he makes his way through with straight C's. That was what he was a C student at Harvard. I mean, I don't, huh. I don't know. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I, he, 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 I, I do know that he was accepted to Harvard, uh, only after his father gave a whole bunch of money to it. I mean, he was a, a you know, he, he was a, a person who was it purchased his way through donations into Harvard. Uh, I'm not sure what his grades were. I'm guessing fine, right? Uh, because of the phenomenon of grade inflation, <laughs> right? Like that, uh, you know, uh, that Harvard undergraduates are graded like, 
uh, graduate students in the sense that a C is a is an F, right? <laughs> and an A is just the standard grade of you showed up and did the basic work. Uh, uh, but like, but th- but that's what it is, right? Like that that rankings are a way to say, okay, well, the people get funneled into these channels because of wealth and privilege. Uh, are able to hold on to that wealth and privilege because, uh, look, we have these objective ranking scales that tell us actually they are good and yeah. they are better. Um, like, are, are you going to argue with U.S. News and World Report and uh, and and uh, the fact that these uh, the schools have been given this pedigree? Uh, who are you to say? Uh, that uh, that Jared Kushner, because he ha- he has matriculated and he has received this piece of pe- this piece of paper, this diploma that says he is a Harvard man. He is one of our great. Yeah. Men, right. Like, and yeah. Uh, and therefore he deserves everything that he's getting. Yeah. Right? Like and, and like and that's that's how it functions to me. Right. What like what the ranking system does is to paint the lines on the highway. Right. Like this is like, OK, you belong in this lane. And you belong in that lane, and here's what the lanes are, and let's not get them confused. Uh, I and, think that's uh, exactly right. I mean, I, th- I thought we'd just spend maybe one or two more minutes, sort of like mapping some of the the ways that that works, or or sort of trying to understand how this attitude has filtered into like the consciousness of our culture. So you know, like one way of doing this is just to talk about different areas of life where where ranking systems dominate and like most obviously yeah. sports like you know ESPN would immediately explode if rankings didn't exist its whole business model is based on like incessant rambling about ranking of this thing or that thing the best teams the best players the best defensive players the best offensive players the best plays of each week the best plays of the decade. It goes on and on and on and on. It's like the impulse toward ranking has like structured the way that sports fans think and communicate in like a deep elemental way. <laughs> but like, like U S yeah, news yeah. is, is most well known for their college and university rankings, but they have other ranking systems too. You may or may not be aware that they have a rankings calculation for cultural influence. It's a system of how much a particular country influences <laughs> like global trends. And, oh, I thought you said insolence. Oh, oh like, who's the, like who's disobedient. the most disobedient culture? <laughs> Clearly Tunisia. <laughs> hey, settle it down, Tunisia. <laughs> no, it's a system that that describes how much a particular country influences global trends in fashion or cuisine or something like that. Um, yeah, that's super. I mean, nice. I think it's interesting to note that like the COVID nineteen crisis immediately became a ranking phenomenon. You know, like I don't know if, if it was like you. Like, yeah, I, I was just like true. looking yeah. at the the number of cases and the number of deaths for every country every day, and you could sort of see the uptick. You were waiting for the United States to like pass Spain and Italy and all the things. It's just like quiche, quiche, quiche. Of course, Google and all other search engines are based on ranking systems. And so like, well, OK, I mean, I, I have like a couple of things to say, like one, I, I don't know if that we can I don't know if we can talk about like ranking as a phenomenon uh, uh, that is disarticulated from its specific context of application. <laughs> right. Like it, like, you know, ranking is not necessarily bad. Like I think in sports, which is a special realm of life where people compete for winning, you know, for like for for dominance, um, ranking makes sense. Like sports only make sense if ranking is involved. Right. But, That's not but necessarily where, true, though. Like I could imagine a world where like well, there has to be a winner and a loser. Uh, well, right? like, I don't know. I mean, why couldn't sports be more like art? You know? Oh, sure. I mean, well, there are sports yeah. that are like, I mean, I mean, I, I, but like I'm talking about like football or basketball or whatever the ones we enjoy. And I, I think that's perfectly fine. Like, I don't. I, well, I'm not I, saying that it's necessarily know. not fine or fine. I'm just saying like it doesn't have to be that way and sort of examining why it is at that a, way. Yeah. So you're you're talking like at a very sort of like deep psychological level of the ways that human beings exist. Mm, on I mean, Earth. I just th- there's there's no necessary reason that competition has to arise as a thing that people do with one another. I I like yeah, okay. I, I don't know. You about put it that. on I mean, the level of psych- psychological reason. I would put it on the level of 
of infrastructure and the whole point of the show. You know, like what are the sorts of various levels of infrastructure that are affecting the ways that we are in the world, you know? Yeah. I think maybe you're hitting on something like really smart here, which is that the reason that we have sports is so that we have a place to compete uh, that gets that out of our system uh, so that we don't have to compete for resources, right? Like because the er form, right? Like the primal form of competition is human beings comp- competing hmm. for resources uh, for food, water, you know, uh, uh, sex partners, you know, whatever. Um and once you've reached a uh, a certain level of social affluence where you can distribute those resources resources in such a way that people don't have to compete with one another for them, uh, then you can displace that like impulse toward competition onto forms of social uh, other like forms of social performance or enjoyment, right? Like like sports. And and I think that's that's great. So it's like a sublimation of uh, you know I I don't want to sound like an evolutionary psychologist, <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, like I don't I don't even know. I'm just making this up on the spot. My 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 more obvious point I think is just that ranking structures in all of these different ways structure our realities way more than most of us appreciate. Oh, and yeah, and yeah. so this is Thorstein Weber yeah. by the way. Have you ever well, read I, I yeah, encountered like, uh, him in yeah. my intro to sociology class back when I was 18. He is very he's very underrated and 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 uh his his book is his famous book is uh, Theory of the Leisure <laughs> Class. And uh uh and and basically the idea is that everything that everybody does that other people can observe is a way to socially rank themselves vis-a-vis <laughs> other people, right? Like you're just sort of competing for status all of the time. And and like, yeah, I think there's something I mean, to that. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I mean, like, like I'm not prepared to deal with it responsibly, but you can't help but wonder to what extent is the ranking a distinctly modern impulse? Like to what extent is it bound oh. up with capitalism? And like- like on the one hand, people have always been rankers, right? I mean, you can imagine that, like well, like okay. ancient people like like differentiating high grade supplies from low grade supplies and saying this is the best stone and this is the cruddiest stone. Or just forms of social ranking, right? Whether it's by yep, gender or, of or class or whatever. Right? But is that the same yeah. as as making ranked lists by means of calculation? I don't think that it is. You know? Well, I mean, I do think it is, but like there's a there's a, another level of abstraction right like or another level of, of d uh, of it being disarticulated or delinked from human necessity right and so if you think about say the division of labor between uh um, you know male and female or the division of labor between slave and citizen or something like that those weren't capricious divisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are bad mm-hmm. divisions, but they but they did serve an economic interest, mm-hmm. right? Like, whereas rankings in sports are playful, right? Like that that if they disappeared tomorrow, no one would starve, mm-hmm. right? you know? <laughs> like they they like it, you know so like they are they are more symbolic, right? Like they are more abstracted from human beings sort of securing resources. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so like, yeah, I, I mean, I think, so. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I guess the I thing mean, that I, I keep on thinking about, cause I read this article is like the calculation element. Is there a moment where you start to calculate rankings and that, if that becomes a, a different, a fundamentally different kind of ranking, a kind of ranking that's more bound up oh. with some deep, capitalist idea you know so like a, a recursive ranking where you are everything that you're doing is in service of the future ranking that yeah will be right awarded yeah. to you yeah. yeah that's exactly right and i mean and the thing that i wanted to say and this kind of circles back to the point that i was making earlier is like rich people love rankings because they are also the people who control the ranking systems and control the dissemination right. of the rankings like they own well, the, i mean you know they own the means of the we, ranking we talk about this a lot on the show but ranking really is just a straightforward hegemonic process 
<laughs> yeah, it's yeah. rich people saying, you know, actually, this the things is, that we're this doing is are good. very good. This is less good. And what the poor people are doing is <laughs> very bad. <laughs> like that's it is. Yeah, you're right. It's it's just that is like there might not be a clearer example of hegemony at work <laughs> than ranking yeah. systems, right? For things like colleges or or like, you know, best cities to live or or like whatever dumb shit that we yeah. do, right? Like it's just rich people saying, isn't it awesome to be rich and privileged? Like, isn't that? And other rich and, people and being look like, at, look at, look at how good it is. We're yes. number one. In, f- in, in fact, it that. is good. <laughs> 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 so, okay. We got to rank this guy. We got to rank. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Hoisted on our own petard. <laughs> we are slaves to the, oh, <laughs> I feel like that entire 45 minute conversation was a lead up to you screwing me over. I swallowed it. Hook, line, <laughs> and sinker. Uh, I give him like a, I give him like a five because I think that the whole ranking thing is pretty bad. But yeah, I, no. I, you also didn't give me a lot in terms of like financial crime. Uh, there's not or, a lot. There's not a lot like of that. obvious financial crimes out there like you know i did not go deep on zuckerman so i'm imagining you could dig up some dirt but like doing the things that i normally do where dirt comes up pretty quickly for a lot of people it didn't really come up with him he's you know he's kind of flip-flopped politically he's been like a republican and a democrat in different moments he seems like like uh, he has a value system that i don't understand or respect very much. He definitely has a huge yacht, a private jet, (laughs) (laughs) and a bunch of houses and stuff. So I think five is reasonable. I would say four or five. I mean, like, I don't like him, but on the scale of, let's, let's say five. ready to hear about Leonard Stern? Yeah, man. I'm talking about Leonard N. Stern. And uh, and the reason I'm emphasizing the N is because uh, in researching him, uh, I very quickly learned that there's another Leonard Stern uh, named Leonard B. Hmm. Stern, uh, who is a well-known screenwriter and the inventor of Mad Lib. Really? Can we just yes. talk about him instead? That's exactly the thought that I had. It's like, why did we not choose to do a podcast about people who invented things that bring us joy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I I would love to talk about the inventor. Of yeah. At the end of episode, um, every episode, we wouldn't be like filled with so much dread about the following episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <sighs> um, yeah unfortunately, uh, it's not him. It's Leonard N. Stern. Uh, God who, damn it. <laughs> Leonard N. Yeah, Stern. He, uh, very much like uh, Mort Zuckerman, he is a real estate billionaire. Um, they so, must know each um, other. The the Leonard Stern, <laughs> no, Mort Zuckerman. Oh Zuckerman! Oh Zuckerman and Stern. But I guess the Leonard Sterns yeah. probably know of each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they must, right? Like because you know that the billionaire Leonard N. Stern is sitting around googling himself and being like, "Oh, why is it, uh, every result is Leonard B. Stern?" <laughs> Leonard B. Stern is much more famous and deservedly so. He might, you know, I don't I don't know. Maybe he's a terrible person. I have no idea what his deal is, but he did invent Mad Libs. So anyway, I, I thought that I would begin the segment just with some pieces of information. I don't want you to assemble these pieces of information. So don't make any theories. Do not do not come up with a theory about who this man is based on these pieces of information. Um, OK. So I'll start with a quote from a profile in Bloomberg Business Week from 2004. Quote, fighting back is the name of the game. And Leonard Stern still has a sharp left hook. Just five feet, six <laughs> inches tall with a taunt. <laughs> Several reports have him listed as five feet, two inches tall. And this is not this is not meant as an insult to my short brothers out there, but uh, uh, I think five six is an overestimation of of how tall he is. Just five five feet 
six inches tall with a tawny sculpted <laughs> face and a salt and pepper temple. Also sculpted face. He once, I believe, sued someone for saying that he had a lizard what? shaped head. How could you sue uh, someone for yeah, that? Yeah. Which he, which if you Google a picture of him. Uh, we haven't talked to our lawyers. Is, he can't say anything. About it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, with a tawny sculpted face and salt and pepper temples, he can morph from a seductively charming gentleman. Quote, this is Leonard Stern talking right now. Quote, I'm a toucher emotionally and physically, he says, into a shrewd, tough talking business. What? Okay. Oh so, my. Yeah. I'm a, t- I'm a toucher. How, m- how, I mean, who, who of us has not? Whomst among us has not said to a female interviewer, <laughs> I'm a toucher emotionally and physically. Um, it, it, it this was, was a female this interview. must have been um, in the 1980s. Not 2004. Um, okay, moving on. That's one piece of information. Moving on from that. Uh, here's another quote from a New York Times article in 1973. So moving way back in time now, 1973. Uh, Mr. Stern owns a cooperative apartment at 995th Avenue, a summer home in Atlantic Beach, and an apartment in the Virgin Islands. Okay. Having a place in the Virgin Islands, just fine. You can do British that. or U.S.? Uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. Not, not a crime. However, uh, let me move. Let me just, I won't say anything. Let me just move on to the next piece of information. Leonard Stern was also in Jeffrey Epstein's Black Book. Uh-oh. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, but you know, lots of people. So you're are asking in the Black me book. not to draw a connection between Toucher Point A and Epstein Point B. <laughs> like it's hard not to. No, I mean I'm I'm not here to tell listeners what to think. I'm just here to say okay. don't be hasty. Yeah. And uh, lots of lots of people are in the Black Book. Many people. Uh, here's it. Let me let me read another quote. Maybe this will change things for you. Quote, uh, after his divorce from Judith in the mid 1980s, Leonard, quote, dated widely, according to New York magazine, even throwing singles parties for friends to meet new potential mates. In his late 40s, Stern had a style that differed markedly from the reserved button down senior executives of his generation. He liked cigars, good food. <laughs> and <a> pants. <laughs> he. <laughs> He lived in a townhouse on New York City's Fifth Avenue and didn't allow business to get in the way of his social life. Yeah, can I? Can we just? Can I just ask you to pause well, for a second? <laughs> like, do you know anything about Judith? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, I know she didn't last too long. Uh, he married. Okay, so this is this is not in my notes, but I will take time out to just say this fascinating tidbit. Uh, do you know the poster from the movie Jaws where there's like this massive shark head coming up? No, you, the you texted of the it to water, me. Yeah. And there's a yeah. very, uh, well, I did. Yeah. And, and yeah. And so there's this very tiny, pit, tiny picture of a woman swimming, right? And she that's know Judith. This massive shark is beneath her. No, but that's his, that's uh, the wife that he married uh, so, after he divorced Judith. Yeah. Uh, a young, right. a young model. Um, so, um, uh, he liked cigars, good food, and dance. He lived in a townhouse in New York City's Fifth Avenue and didn't allow business to get in the way of his social life after his divorce. Quote, I'm not a playboy, but I do like to have a good time. End quote. No law against having a good time. Well, that's actually not true at all. Most laws prevent the really good times. <laughs> that's actually a really good point. Like, most laws are against... The best ha- times Where does that are saying even the- come from, then? <laughs> most laws are against having a good time. I mean, and there's good reasons not to have that good of a time. Yeah. You know, this one, questionable, but but uh, uh, his company, uh, he was con- uh, Stern, was convicted of hiring prostitutes to uh, entertain customers at trade shows. That's not good. Uh it, it's not great, uh, and it, but as as part of the same case, uh, interestingly, the company was also documented to be destroying documents and clandestinely taping executives as a business practice. I just want to, you know, and again, I'm not trying to develop a theory here. I'm only trying to sort of like point to uh, some some facts, some disconnected facts that um, uh, he has a record of supplying prostitutes to people and taping people, uh, which there are some other people in the world who have done similar things. 
Anyway, uh, let's let's return for a moment uh, to his post-divorce uh, singles parties. Only single people allowed. Uh, this is a this is a short passage from a n- different profile of Stern from New York Magazine in 1986. Uh, quote: Leonard Stern is throwing a party. A hundred or so people are milling around in his Fifth Avenue limestone mansion, wandering past the Van Gogh, the Monet, water lilies, no less, <laughs> and the antiques. They're traipsing into his bedroom, past the four-poster bed, up to the stairs to the <laughs> up the stairs to the top floor rec room, <laughs> rec room with its telescope and polo mallets, out. T- <laughs> oh God. Out to the windy deck suspended over Central Park and quickly back in to drift downstairs again. Leonard isn't nervous about giving so many people the run of the place. He was kidding earlier when he said, at nine they arrive, at ten they steal the ashtrays, and at eleven they leave. Leonard likes entertaining. Tonight, the host is even keeping in mind the interests of some friends who couldn't make it. Leslie Wexner Uh sent his regrets, but asked Leonard to find him a nice Jewish princess. (laughs) Leonard is working on it. Whoa. (laughs) For listeners who don't know who Leslie Wexner is, of course, he is the billionaire founder of Victoria's Secret, Epstein's close personal friend and main funder of Jeffrey Epstein's operations. Um, Epstein did not have any money before Les Wexner gave him millions of dollars and for unknown reasons, power of attorney. Now he disavowed Epstein in the end. <laughs> uh, he did. Well, he did. He did. He did. He said he, he, he did disavow Epstein and, and he got into his like battles with him. And yet, um, and yet, but, uh, and <laughs> all, all I'm saying is, I'm not drawing any conclusions, but the listeners welcome are, to- <laughs> are uh, welcome to speculate. Yeah, but you've asked them not to, and I'm asking uh, them not to. Yeah. You know what they say. You lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. No. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let me get into the bio. If you know, if you know his name, it's likely because of NYU's Stern Business. Oh, School. I do know that he gave, a, but I, but I don't didn't know. Yeah, he gave, but I know Stern Business School. Yeah, well, that's him. He gave them thirty million dollars, and so they named the business school after him. Um, <clears throat> he made most of his money in real estate, um, which is very boring, and I'm not going to talk much about that. But that's not where he got started. Got started. Do you, do you want to guess? And I, and I, I will, unless you've looked this up, I guarantee you cannot guess where he got started. I'm going to take a stab in the dark. What, can you give me the decade where he came up as a businessman? Ah, okay. This is not going to help you, but, um, well, his father started the business okay. in the 19... 19- 20s and 30s all right see i was gonna say car washes but nope that's not that's not gonna happen uh, no i'm not gonna say that now no then i'm not it's, gonna say that it's uh, it's, uh, it's never gonna happen oh you want no, another I guess wasn't gonna, that wouldn't count as a guess i was saying how your piece of information has gotten me one step closer to the actual industry you don't think i could get it even with 20 questions huh you think it would just be impossible for me to get there we could just spend the whole segment <laughs> me playing twenty. We could we could do the whole segment playing twenty questions, no. but you know, really, the payoff is really right, minor what is it? because the answer is uh, bird seed. <laughs> huh? That's a. Uh, I don't yeah. know how minor that is. So, bird seed is what gave him basically the startup capital to start a billion dollar real estate business. So, it, it's not. Re- he didn't become a billionaire from bird. No, but seed. it's an interesting uh, origin story. It is, and 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 the the origin story is very fishy. Um, I, I, let me, I'll go over it really briefly. So, like uh, Leonard Stern's father, Max, immigrated to the United States penniless, apparently, except he came to the United States with somewhere between, and I read different reports, somewhere between twenty five hundred and five thousand canaries. What I'm curious about is how a guy who is penniless pays for 5,000 canaries to be transported across the Atlantic. That's a little bit weird. Also, he had the canaries 
because someone owed him a debt. And I'm I'm putting up. Air Dude, quotes this is just like a. Sorry, like, this is a prehistory <laughs> of Tiger King. <laughs> I know, right? Like this is that level of weirdness. I, I, it reminds me, like, dear, is it Dumb and Dumber with the? Uh, 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 I said doll hairs, <laughs> not dollars. <laughs> like, oh, actually, I owe you canaries, <laughs> not money. Um, like, who would even accept yeah. that? And as you know, um, that's pretty wild. So. I, I, but, but I, I did want, the reason I'm bringing this up is because that's actually, there is an interesting aspect to it that relates to COVID in the, like, in the sense that, like, those canaries would have been absolutely useless to him, except for the fact that he had this, like, small canary selling business or whatever and for a while, uh, for, yeah, I guess, quite a while, like 10 years, 12 years. And, uh, and then, World War II came along and a number of events converged to make birds more desirable pets. Hmm. Namely, there is a, a shortage of kennel help and the closing down of a bunch of kennels, uh, plus a government ban on the use of tin for dog and cat food containers. Uh, dried kibble was not invented yet. I believe that was a product of the 1950s. Uh, a, a, a ban on tin for pet food containers led to people getting interested in bird. Like they couldn't have dogs and cats. Can and I just interrupt and just say how like, this is the thing that I'm maybe in some ways most interested in. I could just spend my life like learning case studies of how your environment changes so that your yeah. way yeah. of understanding the world is completely fucked. And that's exactly what COVID is doing to everybody right now. But it just basically like strips you of the idea that you have like really any degree of agency in the universe. I mean, you have agency in just like <laughs> the tiniest, most compartmentalized way that's so fragile. And as soon as that's yeah. like altered by all of these forces beyond your control, you're completely helpless. Suddenly we're all putting birds in our house for some reason and nobody knows. Yeah, like, nobody could have predicted that. Um, but that's that's what we're doing now. And so that's what happened, you know, and and he seized uh, and he was also, you know, this is one not just an accident. He seized the opportunity. He aggressively marketed the birds. He purchased a bunch of radio ads where the canaries sang along with organ music. And the selling point was they make this beautiful music for your home and, and that kind of stuff. And people started buying them. And uh, he realized that the money was not in birds. The money was in cages and food and that's that's where he really but it's like it's like also like every weird fucking bullshit thing that people get into is the example of some i mean maybe not everyone but so many of them are the example of some like strategic corporate move like you've heard about the history of fondue <laughs> they just had no. like excess swiss cheese that they didn't need know how to handle there was like a swiss cheese mafia in Switzerland that decided to like remarket this whole that makes sense. way of using cheese according to some old recipe that nobody gave a shit about. And then, you know, in the 1970s, all of these advertisements start appearing of like, like sexy people in ski lodges, like, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I've seen those. fondue. Yeah. It was all just completely out of nowhere. They were just like, we need to get rid of this cheese. How can we get rid of this cheese? <laughs> Turn it into fondue. I don't know. It's just like, same deal. Yeah. Make it into yeah. a dip. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I don't want to get hung up on Max. Uh, I want to, because I'm talking about Leonard. But I am about to blow your mind here that uh, Max named his company Hearts after the Hartz Mountains in Germany, where the birds originally came from. And so H-A-R-T-Z, Hartz, the pet company, flea collars, pet food, all of that shit, that's, that's where it comes from. Hold on a second. Um, Wait, we're talking about the two guys? You're creating a... Am I missing something? Why, 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 why is my mind blown? Well, the, oh, because the this canary business turned into the multinational pet supply conglomerate hearts oh um 
you would think that it would be called, I guess your mind was blown because you would think that it would be called Stern. I thought you were but, taking me back to the Mad Libs guy. I thought you were. Oh, no, no. That would have been a real that's twist. Where my head yeah. was at. I was like, you're going to somehow connect these dots. And I didn't get it, but I'm glad I clarified. No, 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 no. Um, no, I just, it's just, uh, that, that this is not an aside, but it, it actually was the, uh, the creation of a very, very large company. Um, and, and Leonard Stern, uh, the billionaire that I'm talking about actually took over the company when he was only 21 years old. Um, his father handed over the reins to him when he was 21 and he became absolutely ruthless in trying to destroy all competition, bribery, coercion kickbacks, prostitution, uh, like everything that he could do, he did to corner the market on pet supplies. And it worked uh, at one point, And I think in the 80s, yeah, in the 80s, um, uh, Hearts owned 80% of the pet supply industry. That's in pretty wild. States. Yeah. And uh, as a result of that, they ran into a bunch of antitrust lawsuits and he had to pay a bunch of fines. He he sort of took that to where he could and then started diversifying his business pursuits. And he went mainly into real estate and bought up a bunch of property in the New Jersey in northern New Jersey in the Meadowland I kinda area. I'm sort of familiar with that area. I mean Oh I'm, really? Eh, not that familiar, but well, I mean I, I Right. You know, now it's different in the sense that like it's a big residential area and shopping area and that kind of thing. But when he bought it in the 70s and early 80s, it was mainly known for being like a huge chemical dump. Right. Like hmm. like all of the sort of jokes that people make about New Jersey were about that area during that time. Hmm. Um, just absolutely worthless, industrially ravaged land that no one else wanted. And he bought it. And, you know, and then it becomes more and more expensive to live in New York uh, after the dirty 70s and people begin moving more and more to New Jersey and um, and the, the value of the property increases and increases and increases. So like a $10 million investment, I think turned into over a billion dollars, right? So like that was the level of increase that he was dealing with. At that That's a estate. pretty smart investment. I guess it so. turns I mean, it could have got, it could have easily gone the other way. Right. You know, he, he got, he got lucky. But that's everything. Yeah. It's smart yeah. in retrospect. Um, what he did do that I think uh, was actually smart is that he built uh, there a place called Harmon Cove. Uh, have you heard of Harmon Cove? Mm -mm. Well, it was the first outlet mall in the United States. Uh, he invented destination retail shopping. Uh, so now we've talked about the first mall and now yes. the first outlet mall. I'm outlet sure. mall. Yeah. that He invented that. Um, That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Although I, you know, I imagine like it was a very historically sort of like delimited phenomenon, right? Like I don't imagine that. I mean, yeah, outlet malls are still popular or whatever, but they're clearly a uh, sort of zombie consumer phenomena, right? Like they're on their way out. Why? Who's going to drive ninety minutes to go to an outlet mall to save like twenty percent on a real retail deal that like you could find the same deal online they exist and they're still popular but they're they're clearly on their way out but that but that's uh are they more you know, on their way out than like actual malls they're not, uh probably about the same i don't know i mean you know the thing that the thing that destination retail has going for it is that it's a thing to do with your kids like it's a way to get out of the fucking house the thing that it the, doesn't the have going for the it the misery of your is domicile that no one is allowed to leave their house for fear of dying <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's probably not doing really really <laughs> great at the moment but like but i mean if you think about like the american way of life what could be more american than destination shopping right like and, and so it's it's probably like I'm taking a vacation to shop, right? Like that's the most American thing that there is. Nevertheless, I think they're I think I don't think they're too much longer. Uh, anyway, that's where all his money comes from: New Jersey chemical dump real estate. And uh, 
That's very boring. I do want to say something, though. Uh, this is where I'm going to end up, is, is that I do want to say something about his, uh, his move into the publishing industry, uh, because that resulted in some... Well, what I think are very funny things happening. Which is exactly what my guy did. You you said <laughs> yeah, this full circle. That's what. I, yeah, yeah, they have very parallel lives. Um, the uh, so the first thing, the most high, high profile thing that he did was to buy the Village Voice. Hmm. Um, and he ran that for a while, and he didn't mess with it too much, and it really wasn't a big scandal. He just kind of like you know I don't know would weigh in once in a while or something. Uh, but he also invested in a ton of other city weeklies, hmm. uh, LA, LA Weekly, City Pages, uh, Seattle Weekly, Cleveland Free Press, Minneapolis City, city Pages. That's like all kind across of the interesting country. market to get into. Ah, can you guess why? Because it, it makes a lot of sense. No, I can't guess why. Well, okay. So think back to your life in the late 90s, early 2000s. You're in college. Yeah. You're maybe getting out of college. You're, yeah. You're 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 going different places in the United States. Yeah. What are you What are you doing when you're going to a new place? Uh, I'm searching for jobs. Ah, you're searching for jobs. You're but you're searching also for search- apartments. And stuff. Apartments. And where do you search for apartments? Like before the, the, the internet, the, class, the classified, the city paper, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the free, the free Dude. papers that you can pick up. Um, are I the got my first. That- I got my second job from the classifieds. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Like uh, like in the paper, the local paper. I mean, I I. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I my my father used to uh, force me to like read the classifieds and, and apply to jobs in there. I'm not sure if it ever panned out to anything, uh, but I definitely every time I would go to a new place, um, in and I've lived in a lot of different places in the in the U.S. Uh, every time I would go to a new place, like that's that's where I would look for apartment. The fact that I got a job from an ad placed in a newspaper. Makes me feel like I'm fucking ancient. Yeah. If you told that to somebody who was 20, they would be like, what? <laughs> are you serious? I mean, I don't like feel that. that ancient, you know, yeah. but it really yeah. feels like that is a, another era. It is. It is another era. And and that's that's the thing that I think Leonard Stern missed uh, is that he was right on the cusp because this was in the 90s. He was right on the cusp of that model becoming completely obsolete. Hmm. And uh, and they all, uh, you know, all of those ventures just sort of like financially failed. Uh, he, he didn't make a bunch of money from weekly papers in cities. Um, but that's but interesting that he that's kind of, not what it's of, about. OK, what is it about? That's not what the story I'm telling is about. It's about his son, Eddie. <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is where I want to remind viewers that I started this out saying that Leonard Stern is very similar to Trump in the sense that he has two massive fail sons who run his businesses who are just way, way more interesting than he is. And the first one, and I'm not going to talk about Manny. Uh, that's his other son, uh, who also has messed up a lot. But I- I'm only going to talk about Eddie. I know it's hard, Joe, to remember anything that happens in the news that has to do with Trump uh, because it's like a continuous stream of just st- stupid shit happening all of the time. I want you to search your memory palace. And do you remember... Like or in 2015, this is leading up to the election. There was a story about a magazine that had that played a trick on a bunch of rich people to test how cheap they were by sending them like increasingly smaller checks from a fake rebate agency to see if they would cash them or not. And the story was that Trump turned out to be the cheapest of them because only him and one other person who was like a Saudi prince cashed the checks for the smallest amount, which was 13 cents. So they would send these what? checks to their their personal residence. I think they started with the checks for like a dollar twenty. And then they would like they had a few levels and and, and so like uh and Mort Mort Zuckerman was one of them and he cashed the like dollar twenty check. But like once the checks got down to 13 cents, Mort Zuckerman wasn't 
cashing them anymore, but Trump did. And uh, only Trump and one other person bothered to cash the 13 cent check. <laughs> that story appeared in Spy Magazine, which uh, in 1990. And Spy Magazine was around in like the late 80s and to the mid 90s. It was about it went on for like 10 years. And that was one of the journalistic outlets uh, that Leonard Stern owned. And he let his son, Eddie, who wanted to be a creative writer, run it. And um, and Eddie even wrote for the magazine under a pseudonym <laughs> of Julius Lowenthal. And in fact, Eddie Stern wrote that very story about the cheapness of the super rich. So this is a, this is a sort of interesting thing to me. Like Eddie Stern, a.k.a. Julius Lowenthal, the son of a billionaire, because Stern was a billionaire at that time, was writing articles in Spy Magazine, a magazine that his billionaire father had given him about how cheap rich people were and how they were willing to sort of like violate ethical principles to, you know, to get tiny sums of money. Okay, so here's a quote from billionaire's son, Eddie Stern, a.k.a. Julius Lowenthal. Quote, but just how money-loving are America's rich and famous? Sure, the mega-wealthy are forever doing unseemly things to make a buck, engineering hostile takeovers that leave companies hobbled with debt, for example, or erecting huge skyscrapers that crowd and darken already shadowy city streets, or denying their soon-to-be ex-wives an equitable share of their assets. Uh, end quote. Okay, so I want, you, I want you to remember that quotation as we move into the real story about Eddie Stern. So that's that was all preamble. And he wrote that. He wrote that. So it's just basically um, being like, fuck you, dad. Yeah. Well, um, it, it was more fuck you, Trump. Um, and, and I'll get to that at the very, very end. Um, but yeah, also fuck you, dad. And, and uh, well, well, we'll circle back. So shortly after Spy Magazine went under, you know, Eddie ran it into the ground. Uh, he started to work for his father. Because what do you do? You know, like, oh, I can't be a creative writer. I can't run this magazine. I'll just go work at my father's business. Uh, he instantly became a money loving criminal of the kind that he was criticizing in the pages of Spy to the point where he became the central witness in New York Attorney General Elliot Spitzer's investigation of what became known as the mutual fund scandal that took place from 2000 to 2003. Uh, oh, what, because gonna... he, he had a, like a, uh, an agreement with Spitzer? Yeah. He was under yeah, investigation yeah, yeah, yeah. and then he plea bargained or whatever. Um yes, uh, to an extreme degree. So the mutual the so-called mutual fund scandal, Eddie Stern was the main guy. He was the guy who was who was doing this crime in the worst and most flamboyant uh, way like uh, just un I'll get into some some facts in a minute but like he was the main person who was involved in this in this specific financial crime. Uh, he got off because as soon as Elliot Spitzer came to him and was like, hey, are you doing crimes? He was like, I will tell I will rat out everybody. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> oh <my God>. what? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, he he ratted out hundreds of people. Did he, he get at people above him? There wasn't really anybody above him in his, well, there was one person above him in his organization, and that was his father, who, okay, you know, again, I don't want, I'm, uh, this is alleged information, but like, uh, uh, he, uh, he uh, there is some question to, to the degree to which Leonard Stern was aware of the crimes that were happening. It was taking place at Canary Capital, which was owned by Leonard Stern. Canary, we remember the Canaries, right? And, and uh, Leonard Stern often spoke approvingly of Eddie's operations. And there's also uh, some speculation in some articles that I saw that Leonard Stern is the, quote, unindicted co-conspirator that is mentioned in a number of court documents. I see. So I'm just going to give you a quick outline of what happened because I think it's actually pretty interesting. And this is, <laughs> I'm drawing mostly from an article titled, the Secrets of Eddie Stern, colon, if you think you know how bad the mutual fund scandal is, you're wrong. It's worse. <laughs> so <laughs> Eddie Stern 
uh, he ran a hedge fund for his capital, uh, for his father called uh, Canary Capital. Um, it was very successful. Uh, in the year 2000, for instance, when the S&P dropped 9%, Canary Capital had returns of 50%. What? Uh, he had years. That's Druckenmiller his... level. No, no. This is far beyond. He had years where his returns were in excess of 100%. That is, that is another <laughs> he... level. <laughs> He was he was like printing money for himself and his investors. Everybody wanted to invest with Eddie Stern. He was really great at being a hedge fund manager, but only because, and this is my theory, that all hedge funds are criminal enterprises, only because he broke the law. Sure. Um, yeah. So what was he doing? He was what was known as a market timer. It's sort of complicated, but market timing basically means that like traders recognize have recognized like patterns in markets at this like really zoomed out level where you don't need to predict how well any specific specific stocks will do you just judge whether the market in general is likely to go back up after a dip happens so it's like it's not an exact science but it is highly predictable so how do you do it you just invest in indexes uh, in specific ways yes yeah, that is exactly right yeah. you invest in mutual funds yeah. Now, neither of us are investors. We don't know a lot about investing, but you know, like you know, people have retirement funds through their jobs, and and you're aware. If you try to take your money out of a mutual fund before like some term comes due, you get massive penalties. You're not allowed to just like you're not allowed to day trade mutual funds. You're not allowed to be like I'm going to put it in for four days and then take it out. And and not have to pay anything uh, as a penalty. Like he, that, that, that it, it it's it's written into the rules of mutual funds, and in fact, it is illegal according to the SEC. So you, you know what a mutual fund is, uh, but for listeners who might not remember, mutual funds are just sort of like bundled stocks, right? That that peg their their value to the market. So the market goes up, the mutual fund goes up, the market goes down, the mutual fund goes down. They are things that people invest in as retirement funds, and and so you're not putting money in, taking money out. You're not sort of like doing this day to day, you know, uh, dealing with it. But this is what market timers like Eddie Stern did. You they would watch for a dip in the market. And then when that dip happened, they would buy a big chunk of a mutual fund and then they would sell it a day or two and later. And they would just when take the, the 20% hit or whatever. And then that would still. No, be no, 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 no. <laughs> you would think that. <laughs> but they made deals with the banks such that they would not have to pay any penalties. How do they do that? That's just some private, ah, private yes. angle. They would give them things called sticky assets, which means that they would invest money with them and say, I don't know, other mutual funds or or whatever that would pay off big fees to the people who worked at the banks. Uh, and so they would be happy and they would say, hey, let us do this little weird thing on the side with your mutual funds um, and we'll give you this other money and, and we'll just let it sit there. And I mean, you're going to collect fees from this. And so you'll be happy. We'll be happy. Right. Guess who's not happy? People with retirement funds, because <laughs> what they're doing is manipulating the market in such a way that it costs billions and billions of dollars for people who have retirement funds invested in in mutual funds. They I mean, like tens of billions of dollars a year. Right, like are are coming out of are are not being accrued to people's retirement funds because of the operations of market timers. That is so infuriating. Um, it is very infuriating. So, well, it's it's going to be more infuriating, Joe, when you when you figure out that uh, or when you hear that uh, Eddie Stern was not a uh, lone gunman, uh, but the entire mutual fund industry was in what was doing this uh, it, every yeah. bank ev of course they were. every hedge fund they all were but that's not where it stops either because they needed more and uh they they so they more brazenly broke the law by doing what's called late trading uh and late trading uh unlike market timing uh which is prohibited by mutual funds and and the SEC doesn't like it if it gets too egregious or at least at that time it was a little bit gray uh late trading is just straightforwardly 
illegal. Like that's why you know how they do the bell at the stock exchange, right? Yeah, so you can't do it yeah, after the bell. That's that's why they do it, right? Like then <laughs> late trading is when like so like the markets close. And you study uh, the information that's coming about out about like quarterly reports or whatever, and you you are able to make a almost certain prediction that the price of a stock is going to go up the next day or the day after that. Who would and, do, who would accept a late trade? Well, everybody, everybody at that point, like uh, that that people that I mean, there were tons of people doing it. like bank of america you know like everybody was do as in business with eddie stern every every big bank was in business with eddie stern God, it just seems like it would be like unnecessarily risky no one was watching like that's the thing is like nobody was watching and so like they like i mean they literally had people backdating invoices like they had people just writing down the incorrect time eddie stern's Hedge fund, the people who worked there didn't show up until after four o'clock. Business hours began after the markets closed. And so the entire operation was just studying stuff that was coming out uh, 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 that would give them an advantage such that they could buy. Talk about flamboyantly and explicit. So all you had to do was show up to his office and yeah. be like, what the 99 fuck? 99% is doing here? of his trades were submitted after market close. So he was just waiting to get busted, basically. He was just like, how long is this going to go? He did testify in court that he had come across a minority legal opinion that suggested late trading was not in fact illegal even though it's just very straightforwardly in a in a codified way illegal right he was like well i had some questions yeah. <laughs> you know like uh, he pleaded ignorance right like uh, uh, but you know <laughs> Um, uh, Spitzer described yeah. it as betting on a horse after the horses had crossed the finish line, right? Like that, that, that's basically what we're doing. Yeah. So Eddie, Eddie was a very bad hedge fund manager. So bad that when, after he got busted, his hedge fund continued to operate and he had returns of 1.5% as a hedge fund manager. You, if you found a good savings account, you could get more than 1.5%, right? Like that it is, you are basically utterly right. failing yeah. at every choice that you make, right? Like, um, right. Uh, and so then he shut it down. Right. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ. That's a, that is a crazy story. And it was a scam. It was just a criminal scam. Um, and it turned out everybody was doing it. And that's why Eddie Stern did not get any prison time and just had to pay a bunch of fines. And then he was not allowed to trade securities for like. So what is he doing today? Is he just still just. Ah, he is running his father's company and you cannot find any information about him online after 2003. Not even a photograph. Uh, there is a photograph of him that is definitely from around that time. Uh, and that's the only, there's only that one photograph online and there's no other information about him Jesus after 2000. So, Christ. yeah. And, and the crazy thing is that his other brother, Manny, who's just made bad business deals, but not been like straightforwardly criminal like that. Plenty of information about him online. You can find a ton of stuff on Manny, all kinds of pictures, like everything. What I didn't mention is that Leonard Stern had a feud going on with Trump since the 1980s. And in fact, he even executive produced a documentary about what a fraud Trump was in 1989 called Trump. What's the deal? I think we've, we uh, have more than six people on the show who have had active feuds with Trump at one point or another. It's, it's a lot. Um, I mean, God, he's just yeah. reviled at every level, like, and yet loved by assholes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, but, but so, so like the, the documentary was never released because of Trump lawsuits against, uh, Stern and, and the producers. So let's rate them. Yeah. I mean, I think worse, worse than Zuck. So I was going to go with eight. I would say seven. All right. Let's go with seven. (laughs) 
So we're at the end of the show. And at the end of the show, we pick the billionaires that we're going to be studying for the following show. And we spin our random billionaire selector, which Chad has on his end of the line. And, and I'm guessing you're queuing that up right now. I am, I am queuing it up. Um, let, me, let me put in my special Excel random number generator formula. Um, feeling lucky today, man. Feeling real lucky. It's been a bad few weeks, been a bad few months. It's been a weird year so far, but tonight, yeah, I think I'm going to come up with a good roll. Well, okay. Number one is uh, number 328 on our list. Uh, Jeffrey Lurie, uh, owner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Huh. Um, former professor of social policy and outspoken owner of the Philadelphia Eagles NFL team. That's interesting. Um, Not yeah. that we haven't already had many sports team owners on the show. I think like maybe the majority of people that we cover <laughs> own one kind of sports team or another. But the Eagles, I um, lived in Philadelphia for a year, and uh, I have a lot of close friends who still live in Philadelphia, or a few at this point. Okay, so that sounds like a possibility to yeah. you. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me uh, reload my my generator here. Number two seventy one on our on our list: Denise York and family, known for being the owners of the San Francisco Forty. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's a head to head matchup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you want to do? I'll, okay, I'll so do. a little bit more about Denise York. Um, uh, her father was Edward DeBartolo, uh, who bought the team, DeBartolo. Um, yeah. I'm doing Philly. You're doing San Fran. That's all there is to it. All right. Well, Chad, it's a pleasure to be talking to you, even though the world is on fire. Thanks. Thanks um, for being here, bro. Yeah, you too. Uh, thank you, everybody, for checking back in with us. And... Uh, we'll catch you next time.